Well, the quality difference between a $10 bottle of wine and a $30 bottle of wine is much greater than the difference between, say, a $30 wine and a $50 wine. Natalie McLean traveled the world over to seek out the best wines you can get at reasonable prices. And she talks about the adventure, the colorful winemakers she met, and the good and great wines she tasted in her new book, Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines. It's an engaging and light-hearted look at wine with some very good information as well, of course. And if you are an aficionado of uh, good and reasonably priced wines, I have three hardcover copies to give away, courtesy of the publisher, Doubleday Canada. And the details are coming up after my conversation with the author. Natalie McLean, it's great to have you back once again after all this time. Ah, oh, it's great to be back, Mark. This sounds like an amazing adventure. Um, we were just talking briefly before we, we began this, but uh, this trip around the world did not happen all in one shot to visit all these wineries, did it? No, my liver couldn't have taken that. <laughs> it was actually spread out over about five years, and uh, I went to eight different countries. Each chapter is a different country and spent a good amount of time with a lot of winemakers, so two weeks per country at least and uh, 40, 50 wineries, trying to find those passionate, obsessive winemakers who, in telling their stories, I could tell the story of wine. What, uh, to what degree has uh, winemaking become uh corporate uh, because you know some of these wineries for example some have been in the family for a while but now they've become corporate as as bigger firms buy them out so how many uh, you know how would you say uh, independent wineries are there around there are still lots of independents, but it, the wine industry, like many others, is concentrating and consolidating. So in Australia, I think two corporations account for 80% of all wine produced. So they own many, many wineries, but they're all under the umbrella of uh, two large companies. Um, so, you know, that has interesting consequences. But um, what the good side is that it's enabling some of the smaller wineries who are now under this corporate umbrella to get better distribution, to have access to better marketing and that sort of thing. Of course, the flip side is that, you know, small family-run wineries do have that, I don't know, special place and, and cachet in terms of the, the, the traditions. The personal touch of Exactly, else. exactly. And in wine, it's not about how much you can produce. It's how well you can produce it. And what about the individual characters that some people impart to their wines? Do they, do they reflect a <laughs> an, an, an personal attitude? Or right, like is dogs and their owners or something. Scientific is, you know. Yeah, they're, they're definitely the, the decisions that they make, either in the vineyard or in the winery, definitely influence the taste of the wine. And so, you know, I certainly met winemakers who were bold and brash and upfront, <laughs> and their wines were like that too. So what would that mean? You'd let, let the grapes hang longer on the vine so that they're super ripe and translate into big, bold flavors. You might oak the wine, give it a nice toasty, whatever. But yes, yeah, cer certainly there was some crossover there. The, the difference between a good wine and a, and a not so good wine is, is harder to tell as they get more expensive, right? It is, it is, because as you get up into those upper price echelons, what you're paying for is less and less uh, the cost factors and more the rarity, a high critic score, collectability. So it's not you're paying what you get, you're paying for what other people want. And so I don't know what the cutoff price is, maybe $30, $50, but above that, it's really hard. There's no linear relationship. Mm -hmm. Like a $100 bottle is always going to be 10 times better than a $10 bottle. Mm -hmm. What about the, the age factor for people who are testing wine? I mean, uh, as, as we know, you, you, your, your senses get a little bit duller as you get older. <laughs> uh, when people are coming to wine, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people who are come to wine in their 20s. They tend to get... So if you haven't developed your palate mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to recognize taste, if you're coming to it late, is it beneficial to, to spend a lot of money on a wine? I mean, will you be able to tell the difference between a... A $35 bottle of wine and a $20 bottle of wine, for example. Hmm, I guess that does depend on the person because um, being able to, you know, analyze or detect aromas in a wine does differ by, by person. But I think um, people underestimate just how much they know, and it's a matter of just paying attention. So 
uh, something I have done in the past and still continue to do is when I slice open some fruit or vegetables in my kitchen, I smell them because I, I'm developing a smell memory bank, and that helps me recognize some of the aromas that are in the wine. I'll also, you know, smell spices, even the leather chair in the den. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a note of caution, though, make sure no one's watching before you start sniffing your furniture. But, uh, you know, that can st start to help you recognize because we just don't pay attention. You know, we're a very visual culture, very aud auditory culture. We're not a very smell-central mm -hmm. culture. We don't need it anymore to, you know, find food or uh, keep away from predators. So it's just a matter of paying attention and thinking, what am I smelling here? Why did you decide to embark on this uh quest, as it were? Well, you know, it was a debate between the world's best bargain wines and the, the world's best wines. But I thought, you know, for the world's best wines, you'd be looking at really expensive bottles and have an audience of about seven. And <laughs> I really want to connect with people. Most of us are, have a budget. And especially coming out of the recessionary times that we've just been through, it's, it's not realistic to think you're going to slap down $50 a, a night, you know, for your bottle of wine. So I was out there looking for the wines in the 10 to $15 range that taste twice as expensive as they cost because I think that's realistic um, in terms of the budget, but we don't want to give up good taste. What, uh, what magnificent discoveries did you make on this uh venture? Wine-wise, um, you know, there there's so many interesting regions that are emerging now. You know, Argentina with its, you know, ripe, fleshy, robust, dark Malbecs. They they clock in at about $12, $13, and they're terrific. Um, that's a new world country trying to establish itself in our market. But then the flip side are traditional countries like Germany that's trying to get rid of a dreary reputation, you know, from several decades ago. We all think of it as that sort of syrupy white stuff that we might have tried first behind the high school portable, but they're now uh, making really superb dry white wines like their Rieslings, and, and they are also super competitive in terms of their price because that's the only way they're going to get you to try their wine. What about matching uh, wines with foods? I mean, it used to be, uh, you know, red with meat mm -hmm. and white with fish. And, and is that sort of by the wayside to a certain extent because of the variety now that's available to us? I mean, we have, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, access to all these wines from around the world was not near, certainly in this country anyway, uh, it was not nearly the case that it is now. That's right. And so we have such choice when it comes to our cuisine and all the influences of different cultures and the way we're mixing it up and fusion and all the rest of it. And we have so much choice when it comes to wine. So the combinations now are, are really interesting and fun. And I think um, it's not something to stress out about. There's no more, you know, what's this? What's the perfect wine for this meal? It's have fun with it and experiment. Um, that said, the you know, there are certain rough guidelines you can keep in mind. Like if you're going to have a, you know, a big juicy red steak, look for a wine that can handle the weight and flavor of what's on your plate in the glass. So maybe a big honkin' Australian Shiraz is going to handle that steak. Do, uh, I mean, we were talking about Shiraz, for example, which is a great grown around the world now, all places, all places do it. How does, how does the the soil and the, the climate of one place actually affect the same species of grape? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, uh, there's so many factors in just soil alone, and if I went into depth, everybody would really fall asleep. But, you know, there's, you know, how, how quickly does the, the rain drain away into the soil? So how hard are those vines having to work in, in the soil? And with, with wine and vines... Um, it's better to make them suffer. You don't want to water them like your roses. You want to make them suffer. And why? Because they will stop producing so much of the leaves and vegetative stuff and concentrate all their nutrients and therefore flavor into the grapes because they're in almost starvation mode. So they're concentrating, and that's what you want. You want tiny little grapes that are just, but they're packed with flavor, and that's what translates into the wine. So the soil is part of that. You want terrible soil for growing almost anything else, but great for vines. I'm speaking with Natalie McLean, and we're talking about her new book and uh, wonderful adventure over five years. Uh, it's called Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines. Well, Natalie, if you're drinking a wine... Uh, uh, can you can you still taste it after the first couple of glasses or or you know it's, it's the first few sips you taste it and the rest is you know <laughs> getting towards the tipsy part 
True. <laughs> um, definitely alcohol. I mean, we all know it has a bit of a, a loosening effect on our senses. Um, and I think you will uh, satiate over time with a... Um, a particular wine. So when you first put on cologne or perfume, you really smell it at first. Mm -hmm. But our senses do accommodate and start to push that sensation to the back of our uh, sensing mind. So, you know, by glass two, the, in combination with the, you know, satiation and <laughs> the effect of alcohol, probably actually by glass three, you're not really picking it up as much as you would have on the first one. Mm -hmm. What kind of wines do you like? Mm, the ones that other people pay for. <laughs> I am a wine cheapskate. Uh, no. What you You've had that question before. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've grown up with that philosophy, or at least uh, when I started mm. drinking. I really like uh, Pinot Noir. I love mm. it. I know it's almost a cliche to say that now because of sideways and everything else, but the reason I love Pinot is it's, to me, it's liquid silk. It packs all kinds of flavor, but it's not heavy in oak or alcohol or tannin. We do it really well, make Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir really well in the Niagara region and in the Okanagan. And, um, of course, the benchmark is Burgundy, France, but mm. uh, lots of regions around the world make it. Actually, I noticed in this, this grand worldwide adventure, you, you didn't really go to Canada at all, did you? I went to Niagara in the uh, third chapter. It's mm -hmm. all a blur now. But, uh, yeah, so it's just one of eight because I wanted to kind of explore around the world and, and do different regions from the first book. Uh, but, yeah, Niagara, I focused on the Pinot Noir there because I do think it's a bargain. It's not dirt cheap, so it's not bottom-of-the-barrel prices. Mm -hmm. You know, starts at least at 15 or 20, but compared to Burgundy, at fifty or sixty dollars a bottle starting price, it's still a steal. Is there a lot of snobbery still about wine? I mean, you know, you get people very snooty and say, "Oh, well, this is just ten dollar <laughs> wine." Oh, oh. Yeah, I think that's changing um, with a new generation and uh, the the way that wine is so widely available to us. It's more part of our culture, um, more part of our meals, and even in movies and so on. That's all helping. And the sommelier is likely to be a you know a young woman or young man these days as opposed to the crusty old guy with the bow tie and so on. So all of that's helping. Sure, there's still some snobbery out there, but uh, fortunately it's getting into smaller and smaller pockets. Do you, uh, when, when you're doing something like this, how is it, to, how hard is it for you to avoid uh, getting to enjoy the wine and actually concentrating uh, on the tasting aspect of it, to, just to evaluate it, the evaluation aspect, I should say. Right. Well, you know, I, I sometimes think about how do film critics go to a movie and just relax and not, mm -hmm. like, analyze the subplot and all that? <laughs> because it's hard sometimes. Uh, you know, you, you pick up a glass of wine. But I... I I'm slowly learning to turn it off, and I guess it's that maybe that second or third glass of wine that really helps um, to to stop analyzing. But you know, it's I don't, I don't mind it either. I mean, I used to be a dancer for years, and so when I go to the ballet, I have a muscular response to the the women who are up there. I'm not dancing myself, but I think there's a deeper enjoyment when you have a knowledge of something. There's a more total experience of it. That's not such a bad thing. Well, having gone to all these wineries, uh, d does that give you some kind of a, an insight into the wine? Uh, you know, you've, you visited this, a winery in Australia, for example, or South Africa. So when you see that wine yes. in the shelf here in Canada, does that, or in your glass later, yeah. when you're drinking it, I mean, does that give you some different kind of uh, appreciation or viewpoint or understanding about the wine than, than say, me who hasn't been there? Sure, I think it helps um, on a couple of different levels. First of all, you've got it situated in your mind exactly where that wine is produced. You drove there and, and you went to the place, and so you know, okay, that wine came from Stellenbosch, and I know where that is in relation to Cape Town, and I know what the geography looks like and the mountains and so on. Um, so that helps. And I think tasting the wine where it's made, there's some sort of, I don't know, sensory infusion that really helps implant it in your memory because smell and, and memory are the, the two parts of our minds that are directly connected. And so I think there's something about going to a region and tasting the wine there. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy it and have lots of fun with the wine having never been there. But I do think as I go through and I look at the bottles in the liquor store, they are calling up 
memories for me that mm. that's yeah a richer experience well i do have to admit that uh, you know s sitting on the banks of the rhine with a glass of uh, nice white gewurztraminer or something you know is yes. it brings back a little bit of a more image than say in my backyard exactly <laughs> with the same wine <laughs> exactly yeah i know there's something about it cuz wine is social but it's also very sensory if there was a place that you could go back to uh, and a wine that you could go back to after this traveling around the world where would that be natalie mclean <laughs> hard to pick, but I think I would go with Provence, which is the last chapter. And um, I love, the, the heart of Provence is dry rosé, and it's a fuss-free wine. You're not going to, you know, swirl it and analyze it, or you're going to get strange looks if you do. And they have a love, wonderful philosophy of life, and that is just to enjoy wine and local food with the people, you know, that uh, your friends and family, and just, you know, enjoy life. It's a, It's an integral part of living, and um, in that last chapter, I was fortunate enough to be able to sit down and, and enjoy some good rosé with Peter Mayle here in Provence. And, you know, his philosophy really sums it up, I think. You know, life can be a series of edible adventures. I think it's liquid adventures. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just something that uh, um, I think a lot of us want to explore. It, even, you know, as, as we get older, how can we integrate good food, good wine, and good company? Mm -hmm. And where, just as a final thought, where do Canadian wines fit in in all this now? I mean, because we were talking, we both know where Canadian wines were 30 years ago. You yes, know? yeah, exactly. And, and they deserve to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but they've certainly come an awful long way, haven't they? They have, they have. They win medals and awards on uh, in international competitions. The only reason our wines are not well-known outside of the country um, is that we don't produce a lot. And in, in the wine business, that's a good thing. Um, so it has nothing to do with quality. We produce fantastic wines, um, world-class wines, and we're fortunate enough to have access to them because we just don't export a lot of our wines. The ice wines, to a certain extent, but you know our dry table wines are consumed mostly in the provinces where they're made, so we should take advantage of that. And what is your next adventure? <laughs> <laughs> going home and getting some sleep. <laughs> uh, no, I think, you know, I really, actually, the next book, I really want to just focus on Canada and go coast to coast and just really dig into our own wines and what makes them special. One of the things that helped me form this book was just asking uh, my readers and, and the folks who come to my website, nataliemcclain.com, about what they wanted to hear about. So I'm going to be asking them again, you know, what, what is it, where would you like to go with me as an armchair traveler, and what, which wines should I be exploring? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crowdsource it. <laughs> Well, the next time you go uh, to, to Niagara, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. Oh, right? how kind. <laughs> <And when laughs> That's your book, great, Mark. And when your book comes out, we'll have you back in the studio Absolutely. And, with, with some samples from you know, British Columbia, Niagara. Yeah. Wouldn't it be of, fun? <laughs> a whole lineup, coast to coast, bottles to bottles. <laughs> By the end of the interview, it should be very interesting. Yes. <laughs> Taste of Canada. <laughs> Natalie McLean, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Mark. Cheers. And our feature guest has been popular Canadian wine columnist and author Natalie McLean talking about her newest book, Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines. And I have three hardcover copies to give away. Just tell us a personal story, you know, a few lines you have involving wine. Could be funny, could be quirky. Send us an email, put wine in the subject line, and be sure to include your postal address, and uh, we'll draw the winning na names in four days' time. You can also call our answering machine, by the way, and re recount your story there. The number is one eight six six two zero two zero one four five.